ice retreated from Britain 10,000 years ago, but in other parts of the world, glaciers still exist. Jostedalsbreen, in western Norway, is the largest ice cap in Europe, covering almost 500 kilometres squared and having a maximum thickness of 600 metres. The photos and video in this movie are taken from two outlet glaciers flowing out of the ice cap, Tunsbedalsbreen and Nygardsbreen. They give you an idea of the scale and features of active glaciation and show you some of the amazing places geography can take you. The zone of accumulation for these glaciers is high on the upland area of the Jostedalsbreen plateau, although there is also evidence of curry glaciers detached from the ice cap and associated features like the seret between two corries. The weight and stress of accumulating snow and ice gradually removes all the air, turning snow to fern, neve and then ice and making it look blue. Jostedalsbreen is a warm-based or temperate glacier. Whether from rain falling on the surface, surface melt, or pressure melting towards the base, water is present throughout the glacier, supraglacially on the surface, englacially within the ice, or subglacially beneath the glacier. The water eventually emerges from the glacier snout. On Nygardsbreen, the water flows in a river across bedrock and into a proglacial lake in front of the glacier. The slowing down of the sediment-laden meltwater as it enters the lake causes it to deposit the sediment in braided channels. The finer sediments are carried further before they settle, giving the water its turquoise blue colour. If you looked at a cross-section of the lake floor sediments, you would see bands of sediment called varves. Water between the ice and the bedrock acts as a lubricant, accelerating ice movement and increasing the capacity of the glacier to erode the bedrock. Stones placed on the glacier and relocated each year show that Tunsbedalsbreen moves 45 metres per year in the middle. So it has taken at least 400 years for the ice to travel the 18 kilometres from the ice cap to the snout. At the sides of the glacier, it travels much slower, 22 metres per year, because of the friction of the valley sides. Where the glacier has to bend round corners or flow over obstacles on the bed, it undergoes extension and compression, cracking to form deep crevasses and ridges. As the glacier moves, the rocks eroded by plucking and abrasion are picked up and entrained into the ice. Many features formed by these processes occur under the ice and we can't see them happening, but they are exposed in front of the glacier as it retreats. Steep-sided, flat-bottomed U-shaped valleys are gouged out of the bedrock and are often filled with a ribbon lake when the ice retreats. Smaller tributary glaciers, which can't erode as deep as the main glacier, form hanging valleys as the ice ploughs through the valley, it removes spurs jutting out into its path, leaving truncated spurs. On a smaller scale, the rocks and particles in the base of the glacier act like sandpaper, smoothing and polishing the bedrock beneath. Striations are produced when a harder piece of rock is lodged in the ice and dragged over the bedrock. Chattermarks form where rocks being carried by the ice get stuck against the bedrock, gouging a crescent shape as the pressure builds. Eventually, the rock slips, releasing the pressure, and the process starts again a bit further down. The ice is always moving forward, even when overall it is retreating, and like a conveyor belt, the sediments eroded and transported by the glacier are deposited in front of the snout. When you see a previously glaciated area in the Lake District, for example. It doesn't look like this, it's all smooth. The moraines are really smooth, grassed over. If you dig inside them, you get all these angular, unsorted rocks, but on top, 
they look really smooth and that's due to the years and years of weathering and erosion and post-glacial processes which have occurred since glaciation.